Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this EKRN um, workshop. Um, the title of this is The Role of uh, Metrology in, in Improving Reproducibility. Um, my name's Ian Gilmore from the National Physical Laboratory, and I'm joined by my colleagues Richard Brown and Louise Wright, who um, will also be uh, giving uh, seminars as part of this workshop today. So I wanted to start off just briefly introducing NPL, the National Physical Laboratory, and kind of our role in what we do. And, and then we'll move on to, um, to Richard giving a talk on the measure of all things. Then I will come back in to talk about re reproducibility and research and development. And then Louise will follow with uh, digital approaches to improve reproducibility. And then we'll have a Q&A session. Okay, so um, here we are from the National Physical Laboratory. Get the next slide. So our mission is um, to provide the measurement capability that underpins the UK's prosperity and quality of life. And in the background, you can see our main entrance to um, MPL in Teddington. We have lots of other research places around the UK as well. It's a glorious sunny day today here in Teddington. So uh, the picture is pretty re repeatable, not always repeatable, um, but today at least it is. So the international measurement system, um, how does that work? And Richard will talk to you in much more detail about this than I will, but I'll just give you kind of like a quick intro just so you can kind of set the context of, of NPL and um, what a national metrology institute is in your mind. So out, out there in the world, um, we have um, the need for business, government, society to make accurate traceable measurements. And how does that traceability um, come about? Well, you have a traceability chain through to your National Measurement Institute. Um, and in the UK, it's the National Physical Laboratory. And that could be through multiple cal calibration labs as you sort of, um, depending on the level of accuracy you want. But it can sometimes be um, with industry and academia that they come directly to us because they, they want the highest point of reference. They really want the most accurate measurements um, that you can get. But how do we ensure that sort of traceability um, and the linkage to the SI system? Well, we do that through doing intercomparison studies um, with our other NMI colleagues around the world, for example, NIST in the US, PTB in Germany. Every country will have one of these NMIs. And we do extensive and very detailed comprehensive studies, which underpin the SI system, of course, and, and Richard will tell you much more about that, and all, all other sorts of measurements to ensure Accuracy, that's the trueness of the measurement and precision, um, which is you know, how close measurements are together. But this, the whole, the whole things of measurement is of course uh, complex in that um, there's evolving needs in both the science and industry base. And so we collaborate a lot with industry and, and, and um, research institutes and, and, um, and academia to take on new measurement techniques. So if you go back in time, for example, things like frequency combs um, that are now used all the time for uh, measurement of time accurately, you know, all of these innovations that, that come from the science base feed back into the measurement base and improve measurement quality. So that hopefully gives you a flavor about what we do at MPL. And I wanted to put this in context with the UK science and technology ecosystem. So you might have seen this diagram in the UK um, RI Research and Development Roadmap that came out last year, uh, which has a kind of, you know, all of the sort of main uh, research institutes and MPL is in there as a, we're a public sector research institute, part of the government department base. So this is UK RI here and all of the different um, uh, other research institutes that it funds, as well as, of course, academia. And if we sort of like look at that in some sort of network diagram, it, it's something like this. So we have um, academia, we have research institutes, we have industry, and we have public sector research institutes, of which MPL is one of them. And then we all obviously collaborate um, very extensively together. Um, 
And I just wanted to point, highlight the interactions, I think particularly for this UKRN meeting, our, how we interact with academia and with research institutes. So we are NPL, we are the highest point of reference for measurement, and we do provide international traceability and the equivalence of standards. So that's why people come to NPL. Um, and how do we, we collaborate? Well, you know, we've been working actually very hard over recent years to be uh, more open and um, connected with academia and research institutes. And now we have a lot of joint appointments. Uh, we have our postgraduate institute, which is, has something like 200 um, PhD students in it from all different universities across the UK, which has really uh, been fantastic success. And a great way, I think, we find of, of embedding good metrology and research practices in, in the next generation of sciences. We're very involved in joint grants um, for UKRI, Wellcome Trust, Cancer Research UK, in doing collaborative research. Um, we provide capability access. We have um, equipment at MPL that um, you can't get elsewhere, um, that we've innovated, and um, academics and research institutes collaborate with us to get access to that capability. And we also more recently launched measurement uh, metrology fellowships. Uh, these have been very successful, just for example, like um, um, Glassstone fellowships or Humboldt fellowships, you can apply for these and they will fund you for a, a good period of time. And they're gonna be, they're very prestigious in terms of what they allow you to do and, and move on with your research career. And I hope that uh, next year we'll be announcing the ability to uh, apply for more of these metrology fellowships. So as I said earlier, today we're going to um, focus on the role of metrology in improving reproducibility. Um, Richard Brown will start off by um, giving the measure of all things, then I will follow, and then Louise will come back with digital approaches to improve reproducibility. So with that intro complete, I will stop sharing my screen and pass over to Richard. So uh, thanks a lot, Richard. Thanks, Ian. So hopefully <clears throat> you should now all be able to see that. So my name is Richard Brown. I'm the head of metrology at the National Physical Laboratory. We'll talk a little bit more in this talk about what metrology means, but effectively my responsibilities are ensuring that the quality and reproducibility uh, of a lot of NPL's output and also the equivalence of our national standards internationally, uh, which we'll also go on and talk a bit more about. So what I want to cover then uh, in, in this 30 minutes is why accurate measurement matters, how the measurements we used are expressed, where our current measurement system came from, and how we established international agreement on units, and also how these units have evolved over time particularly with emphasis on how they've changed recently. And here I mean uh, primarily physical, chemical um, and biological measurements and, and units. So when we think about measurements, it actually becomes apparent to us that measurement is ubiquitous. It's absolutely everywhere from uh, the GPS on our mobile phones to healthcare to complex machinery. Uh, to more mundane things like uh, weights and measures. So it either is everywhere, it makes everything function, but it often goes unnoticed. And the thesis I want to put to you in this talk is the reason it goes unnoticed is because the measurement system that underpins all of this actually works so well. And I want to then kick off by making a, a controversial statement, perhaps if there are any mathematicians on the call, that it's measurement that makes science scientific and not mathematics. So mathematics provides us with a language for communication, uh, as I will go on to talk about, but it's measurement and more than that, it's accurate measurement that makes science scientific and allows us to make uh, progress in science and in society. And where does this accurate measurement come from? Well, accurate measurement really is governed by metrology and metrology's definition is, is the science of measurement. So it's the real meta thoughts, the meta processes 
that go into making uh, the measurement. And metrology is this often invisible infrastructure that is assuring the reliability of our, the measurements we make every day. And on the left-hand side there, I've got an image um, showing the uh, measurement space as a, an absolutely huge area, so many measurements being made all the time. Uh, and these are underpinned by a relatively small activity called metrology. And if we want to extend the anal analogy to something more uh, commonplace, we might think of metrology being the road network. Uh, and this allows the traffic, the measurements to flow smoothly along that road network. And, and normally the traffic, of course, isn't, isn't aware of the road network unless there are potholes in the road. So one of the jobs of metrology is to keep potholes off the measurement highway. So onto a, onto a basic example. Uh, when we talk about measurement, we have a language which we use. So here's a very uh, simple example. We've measured the length of a table. We said the length of the table is, is two meters. Now, crucially, this has three parts, this statement. The thing that we're measuring, a number, and a unit. Now, we agree on length of the table because we have an understanding and an agreement on language. We understand what's meant by two because we have agreement on mathematics. We understand nowadays what's meant by meter because we have agreement on metrology. And this was possibly the most difficult of those three to achieve agreement on. And in fact, in uh, the early days, when we talk about early unit standards, the earliest unit standards related to the human body itself. And in particular, the, the qubit is a very famous example of length standard from the tip of the uh, fingers to the elbow. And indeed, this was an incredibly convenient length standard because everyone possesses a qubit. You're carrying it around with you all the time. Now, it, it's convenient, but of course, it's not very comparable because the size of everyone's qubit is different. Now, the ancient Egyptians encountered this problem and they solved it by um, enshrining the qubit in a particular human body. So in this case, the uh, pharaoh and the pharaoh's forearm became their definition of the qubit. And all of a sudden you had a measurement standard that was comparable but it was no longer convenient because the pharaoh had to be present if you wanted to, to make any length measurements. Now, the ancient Egyptians solved this problem as well. They enshrined the length of the pharaoh's forearm in a transportable cubit bar, um, as you can see in the, in the top right here. So all of a sudden, we had a measurement standard that was uh, convenient and comparable, but actually it wasn't universal. And we see this if we move forward to the Middle Ages and the bottom right picture there shows some weights and measures built into the wall of a town hall in southern Italy. And if you purchase some goods in, in, in this time, you could check that the length you were receiving was right or the volume of grain that you were receiving was consistent with that town standards. And, and that was great, but it wasn't universal because the town next door had different standards of length and different standards of volume. And in fact, this is highlighted by a very famous example of the beautiful uh, painting by Rubens in the ceiling of uh, the banqueting house in the banqueting hall in London. And this ceiling was commissioned by Charles I uh, in 1630s. And Rubens painted. Uh, the canvases for this ceiling without actually ever visiting London. And, and when these canvases arrived and they were unfurled, it was realised with horror that they didn't fit the gaps that had been left for them uh, in the ceiling of the banqueting hall. And the reason for this uh, was not that England and Belgium used different, uh, sorry, not that they, they didn't have feet and inches, they both had feet and inches, but the size of a foot and an inch in England was different to the size of a foot and an inch in, in Belgium. So it's a really clear um, explanation and illustration that international agreement on units was needed. So the key messages I want to get across from this first part then is that 
all of the science, technology, and engineering and medicine, indeed all of life that we, we use relies on measurement. And it's really accurate measurement underpinned by metrology that allows us to make progress in, in science. Now, the system of, of units um, and quantities we now rely on goes almost unnoticed because it works so well. But as I've shown, this wasn't always the case. And up until about 150 years ago, there was no clear agreement on the units that we should use for uh, our measurements. So how did we get to this situation where we now have agreement? Well, we have to go back really to the French Revolution. And the French Revolution saw uh, the old units associated with the king and the old regime thrown away and replaced with new units. So a definition of the meter, which was then to do with a, a fraction of the circumference of the earth, was replaced by a meter bar, the so-called meter of the archives. And the kilogram, which was then based on the mass of water having a certain volume, was replaced by something called the kilogram of the archives. And they were both uh, placed in the custody of the French Academy of Sciences. But in fact, it wasn't long after that, around 1812, that the, due to the unpopularity of this new metric system, France had begun to revert to the old units. And one of the reasons for the unpopularity were things like you can see on the right hand side here to do with uh, decimal clocks that were introduced. And obviously decimal time is, is something that, that clearly didn't catch on. But if we move forward another 25 years or so, we find that actually the metric system was readopted in France. And this was not least because of the growing use of it by the international scientific community uh, in general. And because more countries were adopting this metric system, there was a danger of a lack of comparability or even rival systems emerging. And prompted by this, and also the need to unify geodesic measurement, for generally for the purposes of, of map making, to ensure that maps of different countries knitted together properly, uh, 17 governments signed what was known as the Meter Convention in 1875. And this is a diplomatic treaty that exists to this day, and it established a permanent organisational structure for member governments to act in common accord on all matters relating to uh, units of measurement. And as we'll see, in initially, it just covered mass and length, but it's grown to encompass all the units that we currently use um, and is known as the International System of Units. So 1875, the Meter Convention was signed. Um, it took a bit longer to actually agree on the size of the metre and the kilogram, not least because we had to fashion artefacts, physical artefacts, to represent these units. And that took about 14 years. So by the time we get to 1889, it was also recognised that it was useful to have agreement on the size of a second. So 1889, the metre, the kilogram and the second were agreed. And we spool forward to the 1950s, and this system had been working so well that it was agreed to add the ampere for electric currents, the Kelvin for temperature, the candela for luminous intensity to that system. And the final base unit of the system, the mole, uh, the unit for chemical measurement, was added in 1971. And that gives us our seven base units of the international system of units. And we, we call that the SI, and because the predominant language of metric system in the early days was French, uh, that system international giving us uh, SI. And these units are uh, very important. So we have on the left hand side here, we have the seven uh, base units that, that underpin the system, the kilogram, the meter, the second, the mole, the ampere, the Kelvin and the candela. And these are considered to be independent from each other um, as base units. But we can use them in combinations together to create derived units that might be useful for us. So very common ones that we might know, such as volume, area, or velocity, or slightly more complex ones with special names like Newton for force, Pascal for pressure, joules for, for energy and work, and so on. 
And, and altogether, this gives us the international system of units uh, that we use today and is the only globally recognized and used measurement system. And one of the advantages of having a system such as this is that this agreement gives us a system that is stable, comparable and universal. And so if a system is stable, it means we can have confidence in trends over time. So the example here is carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. If a system is comparable between locations, it means we can have confidence in differences uh, across Europe here in the example of, of air pollution measurement. And if a measurement system is universal, it means we can combine measurements of different quantities to add value using the equations of chemistry and physics. So an example here would be weather forecasting. And a system like this has, has an even better benefit, which is that over time, it always tends towards improving our certainty in measurement. And as I said, this meter convention is a worldwide treaty, which still exists to this day. And in fact, it's become an incredibly popular uh, worldwide treaty. So as of the start of this year, there were 63 member states and 39 associate states of the meter convention. And this covered more than 98% of global GDP. So in terms of the economy of the world, an amazingly uh, wide coverage. And this system is administered by National Metrology Institute, just like NPL all around the world, each maintaining their own uh, national standards for the units we've discussed. And also, as Ian said, comparing these with partner NMIs around the world to ensure consistency of these uh, national standards from one country to another. So these National Metrology Institutes, they are responsible for developing improving and maintaining all the national measurement standards uh, for these units. And in doing so, they encounter these three really big topics that we grapple with in metrology. So the first is uh, metrological traceability, and this is to do with ensuring that all our measurement results can be traced back to those SI units that we've just talked about. Measurement uncertainty, where we give an indication of how confident, how certain we are in the data that we've produced. And comparison. Now, comparison is, is extremely important because uh, we're comparing our national standards internationally, as I've talked about, but also any measurement we make at all is a, a comparison. And I want to examine that uh, in a bit more detail now. So, if we think of, of measurement as a quantitative comparison, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that we're uh, comparing the magnitude of an unknown quantity with the magnitude of a standard quantity that we know. And this might be, for instance, one of the national standards of the SI units that we've talked about. Now, because uh, we only have one national standard, for instance, held in NPL, uh, it's not possible for MPL to do all those comparisons that are needed throughout the UK and indeed globally um, all day, every day. So actually what we end up with is a system where we have some links in between. So we might have a, a copy of that standard and that might be used to um, compare with a grade two copy and a grade three copy and so on and so forth until we ultimately get to the measurement that compares um, the grade three copy with the unknown. And of course, between each of these comparisons is a bit more time elapsing, a um, bit more distance in terms of where these measurements are done. And each of these therefore introduces a little bit more uncertainty in the measurement. So it, down this chain, as we introduce comparisons, we have a little bit less uh, confidence. But the main point to make is that they are always traceable back to that gold standard uh, of that SI unit, um, uh, which is usually held at the uh, National Metrology Institutes. Now, if we take that schematic of comparison and we rotate it um, through 90 degrees, we have something called the traceability pyramid, which metrologists will uh, often refer to. And this demonstrates how that 
uh, work, how that chain works in practice. So at the, at the top of the pyramid, we have our SI unit definitions, we have our national standards, and they are used to calibrate as we go down the pyramid, secondary standards, reference standards, working standards, um, measuring instruments, and so on. Now, at each step, um, we introduce more measurements into the pyramid. So for example, each national standard is used to calibrate hundreds or maybe even thousands of secondary standards. Each secondary standard is used to calibrate hundreds or even thousands of reference standards and, and so on and so forth. So as we descend this pyramid, the number of measurements we consider increases. And as I showed in the previous example, the measurement uncertainty is increasing as well. And so metrology has a really key job here in terms of the traceability pyramid to um, assure these links as we move down the pyramid, uh, but also to minimize the uncertainty in a measurement experienced by the end user. And there are two ways we can do that. We can either improve our primary standards right at the top, um, or we can reduce the number of comparisons in that traceability pyramid. So the key messages from the, the second part for, from me, um, our current measurement system came from the French Revolution, but it wasn't until 1875 we signed the Meter Convention and had good agreement on the units that we, we now use. And this grew into the international system of units that we use today, founded on those seven independent uh, base units. And it's a globally agreed system that confers on all the measurements we make stability, comparability, and very importantly, also continuous uh, improvement. Now, you might well ask why we have seven base units. Well, it, it's a trade-off. Um, we need enough to keep a clear distinction between independent quantities. Um, and there's also a desire to remove constants from uh, equations. Now, if we have too few base units, we don't really represent our view of reality. But if we have too many, we have too many annoying dimension constants in our equation. So, so really, the seven base units is an historical balance. Um, four of them are very clear from physics and our perception of reality, mass, length, time and electric current. Three of them are not essential, but are very useful additions to the system. So amount of substance in chemistry, temperature and luminous intensity. And, and most importantly, the SI is a practical measurement system designed to be used and to be useful to its stakeholders. And because it's designed to be useful to its stakeholders, the SI has constantly evolved over time um, to meet user needs for accuracy. And in general, this has meant evolving the unit definitions and the realization of those units that we've had um, over time. And I won't go through this in detail, but you can see many, many uh, changes have occurred over the last um, 60 plus years or so. But importantly, you can see at the bottom there that um, until very recently, at least, there were no changes to the definition of the kilogram. And we'll come on to that. So when measurement units evolve, what does that mean? Well, to have any measurement unit, we have to agree on something that is fixed. And when, when we say something that's fixed, we mean it has no uncertainty. And like the SI, for it to be useful, that agreement needs to be global agreement. And there are three options really for agreeing on something that's fixed. We can either have a physical artifact, a material property, uh, or a constant of nature. And the, the first image here is of a material property, and this is of the international prototype of the kilogram, which served as the definition of the kilogram until quite recently. And having a unique artifact like that is very convenient, but it's also the drawback. A unique artifact is susceptible to damage, change and loss. So an improvement on a physical artifact is a material property. And here we have a triple point of water cell, which until recently was used to realize the, the Kelvin. And the benefits of this is we can realize it in many locations. Um, but the experiment that we use depends on the purity of the material. So here, the purity of the water within that triple point cell. And generally, there's only one experiment that we can use for that realization. 
So an improvement on that and what we're really aiming for when we define units is to have a definition which is based on a constant of nature. And, and C here represents the speed of light as a constant of nature. So the benefits of this are that we can realize that unit by any experiment where the governing equation contains reference to the speed of light. The downside is that those experiments are generally uh, very challenging. Just to give you an example of how this has happened over time, the meter is a good example of a, a unit that's been through that transition. So in 1889, the meter bar was forged. It was the international prototype of the meter. It was a physical artifact, a platinum meridian bar, and that served as the world's meter standard all the way up until 1960, where it was no longer fit for purpose for the needs of science and technology at the time and was replaced by a material property. And that material property was the wavelength given out by a Krypton uh, lamp. And eventually that definition was no longer fit for purpose for the requirements of uh, trade and industry and accuracy at the time. And so it was replaced in 1983 by a definition based on a constant of nature. And what, what the metrology community said was that the speed of light is an exact uh, numerical value when expressed in the unit's meter per second. And what that meant was that a meter was the distance traveled by light in exactly that fraction of a second. And so this part has really summarized that our system of certain base units is very much a compromise, a compromise between perception of reality and practical usefulness. And the SI and, and its base units has always evolved over time to meet the needs of, of end users. And the ultimate aim of doing this is to move from physical artifacts to material properties to constants of nature. And this has happened in the past for the meter using the speed of light, as I've talked about. And the aim was for this to happen for all of the base units. Now, the most tricky base unit for, to achieve this was the kilogram. So previously, the kilogram had been uh, based on an inconvenient artifact, a certain volume of water, and then the meter convention came along and the definition changed to being uh, a convenient definition based on a unique artifact, but one which was susceptible to uh, change over time. Now, how did we know that the kilogram, the international prototype of the kilogram was changing? Well, it's a uh, quite a philosophical problem, the international prototype of the kilogram is always or was always exactly one kilogram. So by definition, if it changes, it's still one kilogram. But what we can do is we can look at how it changes with respect to its official copies. And when we do that, and when we've done that over the last 120 years or so, when the, uh, the IPK has been compared, we can see that these shifts are of the order of 60 micrograms in a kilogram, so about 60 parts per million. So not ideal, we really want something that's, that's even more stable than that. And in fact, recently, technological advances have provided um, a solution. So I'm not gonna go into detail here. Um, this would be a, a whole talk in itself, but we had uh, two separate experiments, one involved in counting atoms within a perfect silicon sphere, and one to do with balancing electrical and mechanical forces. And this allowed us to um, perform a redefinition of the mole in terms of the Avogadro constant, and a redefinition of the kilogram in terms of the Planck constant. And the fact we had uh, two very different experiments where we could check their reproducibility using this equation at the bottom, which links the Avogadro and the Planck constant, provided great confidence that these changes were um, timely to make. So the kilogram was the last uh, base unit defined by a physical artifact. It was a challenge to describe in terms of a constant of nature. Um, the solution was improvements in technology, which gave us um, the balance I showed you on the previous page, now known as the Kibble balance. And um, we had both that experiment and the experiments uh, counting the atoms in a perfect silicon sphere known as the Avogadro experiment. And as a result, we were able to redefine both the uh, kilogram and the mole. 
And in fact, this happened on the 20th of May 2019. We had revisions to the definitions of the kilogram, the mole, the uh, ampere and the Kelvin. I haven't touched on the ampere and the Kelvin here, but the story is, is quite similar. And, and this was the result of over 30 years of progress in metrology, probably one of the greatest stories of uh, reproducibility in science and international collaboration that you've probably never heard of. So we now have a system of units um, in which these seven constants have those exact numerical values when, when uh, expressed in those units. So the, the system is very clear, it's very elegant. Um, the one thing that it does result in, in some occasions, is slightly different definitions for the units that we're familiar with. So the definition of a, a kilogram has moved away from something that was very simple and we had for 130 years. Uh, the, the kilogram is the unit of mass equal to the mass of the international prototype of the kilogram now towards something that you can see at the bottom there is a bit more complex um, associated with taking a fixed numerical value of, of the Planck constant. And just to summarize these changes for you, what we wanted to do was have our seven base units that you see there. Previously, prior to 2019, we had three of them based on fundamental constants or in the case of the Candela, a conventional constant three based on atomic properties and one based on an artifact. And as I explained, what we want to do is move those all towards being based on fundamental constants. And after 2019, we almost achieved exactly that. We now have the same seven base units. They're the same size, so no units have, have changed in size, but they now have different links uh, between them. But the main thing is six of them are based on fundamental constants and just that one definition for the second is based on an atomic property still. And so in summary, that's the uh, difference between the linkages and the defining constants that those units are based on. So what does this mean? Well, we used to have prior to 2019, a system where we had unit definitions and we use those to measure natural constants. The redefinition has completely reversed that paradigm. So we now have um, unit definitions in terms of natural constants, and we use those to realize the units that we need to make our everyday measurements. And this is really very important because when we look at how mobile phones have changed over the next 40 years, we really don't know what the subsequent 40 years will hold for us in terms of changes in technology, maybe quantum computing, certainly 5G, smart cities, internet things and so on. But the benefits of the SI system we now have is it's future proofed and it means that um, advances in technology can be directly realized as advances in measurement and improvements in measurement. And so this is this virtuous circle of improved technology leading to improved measurement, leading to improved technology. And that's only possible uh, with the new system, which is based on fundamental constants to define our units of measurement. So the final key messages for that, that final part for me, we now have a revised international system of units. Um, was introduced on the 20th of May 2019 by unanimous agreement. Now, you've probably not noticed this, and one of the reasons you've not noticed this is because all the base units remain the same and of the same size, but are now defined in terms of constants of nature. So the SI is future-proofed, and hopefully you'll notice differences in future because we will allow advances in technology to be directly realized as improvements in measurement. And this means, I hope, that the speed with which we can make use of future innovation um, will depend on the units we have. And because we have units now based on these fundamental constants, we can measure them more accurately and we can make use of these future innovations uh, much more quickly. So thank you, that's uh, it from me. I will stop showing my screen and back to Ian. Thanks, thanks so much, Richard, for that uh, great uh, tour through history and keeping and um, bringing us up to date on the sort of latest advances in the SI. 
Um, now we have um, in the agenda a five minute break, um, which I guess we should stick with, but probably we can, we have a Q and A session at the end, but I think if anyone has any sort of burning issues or points of clarification, they want to ask Richard now, I think that would be fine. Um, and then we can carry on after a few minutes break. Keep my eye out on the chat for any questions. Okay, well, if not, we can always always take those at the end here. Yeah. Will, in the background there, I guess we keep the five minute break, yeah? Uh, yeah, I think it's a good opportunity yeah. for people to grab a drink and a stretch. Um, it can get quite long sitting in front of a screen. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll be back in a couple of minutes at uh, 1.45. Cheers. Hey, it's 1.45. So welcome back everybody to part two. Um, I'm gonna talk about reproducibility and research and development. So a few years ago in uh, 2018, MPL and uh, NIST, we held a workshop on improving reproducibility in research. Uh, and this was, I think, a, a really great collection of people because we have people from the NMI community, people from academia, people from industry, a really very nice um, series of talks and, and discussions, um, which is summarized actually um, in, in this article here, so there's the reference. That gives it also a nice sort of summaries of all of the speakers. Uh, and in this meeting, we um, discuss the the topic, of course, which um, you know everybody knows very well. And I know you need to go into all of these different um, uh, discussion documents on on the reproducibility. Um, for example, whose responsibility it is, you know, these things are the well established researchers, publishers, funders, institute leadership. And we looked at um, improvements, um, for example, reporting summaries and checklists, extending methods of reporting, the open protocols, fair data, which uh, Louise will talk about later, and um, more transparency in, in what we do. But particularly, we focus on the sort of the role of metrology, and as Richard was talking about traceability, repeatability of measurement, the development of international standards, um, reference materials, into comparisons, replication studies, and training. Let's go on to this. And as part, part of this, um, NIST and NPL have both published um, some sort of di discussion articles. Um, this one here, Metrology is Key to Reproducing Results um, from NPL, um, where we looked at, for example, the needs to have closer integration of the research community with the metrology community, um, encouraging funding of replication studies. So, you know, like you used to have pathways to impact, we probably we really need to think about in, in grant applications and, and for funders, path, pathways to reproducibility. So, you know, what are the investigators going to propose as, as methodologies, like in a robust study design, that they can validate the results independently? The quality of the data, measurements traceable to internationally standard, recognized standards, as Rich has been talking about, and also metrology built into scientific training. So, you know, since 2018, um, when we had that meeting, we both NIST, NPL, and other NMIs have been doing a lot of work in trying to have more engagement and, uh, for example, uh, postgraduate training. And NIST also did a very nice article that um, was published uh, by Anne Plant and colleagues in uh, PLOS Biology. Um, and then they were looking at, for example, all of these kinds of things like the robust study design, um, some of the issues around this sort of um, difficulty, particularly sort of in biology about re repeatability and reproducibility and what does that mean, but very much around the sort of design of experiments and characterizing the uncertainty, the documentation, testing and validation. So I think all of these things are, are very important in our research. And we kind of came up with these kind of five um, recommendations for the metrology institutes to, to do more of, um, for example, NPL, NISPTB. 
but then we have an important role to lead into comparisons and uh, proficiency exercises. You know, we do organize these, we have like reference materials, and reference standards, um, and we encourage participation from industry and academia. And a bit later in this talk, I'm gonna give some examples from my own research area and how those have been beneficial. Also that we really set out to be more permeable and open to interaction with industry and academia. Um, as I'm saying, a greater role in doctoral training programs, <clears throat> be a role model for findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data. Um, and Louise will talk about the efforts in the metrology community to, to do more on that. Provide the internationally accepted and standardized infrastructure for the provenance of data. So Louise also will talk about, for example, digital calibration certificates. You know, you don't want paper certificates anymore. All of this wants to be in the metadata of the instrument, which is automatically going into the report. And I think one of the things that we recognized is that with increased um, robotics automation, the ability to get high quality metadata into results is improving. So that's really a positive side of reproducibility. And the more that we can get methods into machine readable formats, um, the better. And we also recognize the need as, as organizations, we needed to do more in terms of professional development of data scientists, um, especially in sort of non-classical research roles. So, People who are data stewards, data analysts, data engineers, they need to have career paths because we depend so much on the ability to be able to find that data, have high quality metadata and to make that open and accessible. Um, it's important that people can uh, develop a career in that uh, role. So as I was saying, my, my research actually is in sort of pharmaceutical sciences, biomedical imaging, and this community um, was really one of the first to sort of wave the flag on the reproducibility crisis. Um, and there was this very nice uh, report from um, the Academy of Medical Sciences and uh, Wellcome Trust on reproducibility and reliability of biomedical research. And um, for example, Bayer Healthcare, they had 67 early uh, stage in-house projects where they were looking at uh, different targets. So these usually sort of proteins. Um, that have been identified in publications of, um, of particular interest for development of drugs. But they looked at those papers and they themselves were only able to reproduce 25% of them completely um, in, in line with the published results in-house. And Amgen also had looked at 53 landmark studies. So landmark, that means that they were published um, in you know, high, high profile journals uh, and they were um, selected on the basis they were reporting something new, and only 11% of those could be confirmed with their own studies. And this, I think, was um, you know one of the things that really kind of rocked the the boat on this topic. And the pharmaceutical sector itself actually has a very nice way of kind of looking at this sort of general issue, which I kind of wanted to to use because I, I find it a very helpful analogy. So. They, they term it in terms of truth seeking and progression seeking. And they kind of come to this thinking through the problems in their own area. So in, in the pharmaceutical research and development, you start off, as I was saying in, in that previous slide, with target identification. That's the identification of a particular protein usually, which is um, implicated in some disease uh, mechanism. And then you want to interact with that protein to disable it, um, to, to make a therapy. So you go through a, a large process then of identifying targets, identifying compounds that, that interact with that so-called modulate, modulate those proteins. Um, and then you refine those drugs to make them more, those candidate molecules to make them more effective in lead optimization. Then after about five, six years, he might get into this stage here of uh, preclinical research, so you're doing animal studies. And then finally, you get into the phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, so healthy volunteers, small set of um, patients with um, the relevant disease, and then finally sort of large scale trials. Now this whole process can take around 10 to 15 years, and you start off with something like a few hundred possible candidates and over time you kind of whittle that down until at the end you only have kind of one that will become a, an actual medicine by which time you spent two billion uh, pounds so it's a very big research endeavor and the, the, the problem that they have is oftentimes drugs will fail at this kind of late stage 
And the problem here is this, 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 I've plotted these on log scales here. So this is the cost in red here. The cost goes up massively when you get into the clinical trials. So you, you quickly into the hundreds of millions of pounds plus in the early stage clinical trials and much more later on. So if your drug's failing here, this is a big problem. You've wasted 10 years of research and development time um, and um, the costs have been, been enormous. So why do drugs fail at this kind of stage? Well, it's not these days, it's not due to safety. That's been well screened out um, by now. I mean, they're very, very good at um, being able to identify those kind of problems very early on. Now, typically the drugs these days fail because of lack of efficacy. So why do they why do they fail at that? And that's a big question. It's a so-called sort of drug attrition topic. And there's much literature on this, um, but I, I, I particularly recommend this one here by Ringel um, in Nature of Use Drug Discovery. And they sort of boiled it down to this progression seeking and truth seeking. And the problem is you've got you have progression seeking because you know, as, a, as an industry, you have to be producing something at the end of your pipeline that you can sell. So, you know, you do have to be milestone driven. But of course, if you're over milestone driven, well, then that maybe that leads to people ignoring weak negative signals. So maybe someone at this stage in the pipeline who won't have any connection with down this end of the pipeline um, sees something which makes them kind of worry about it, but it's pr probably better for their career and better for um, the project team to just to let it kind of slide by. So again, that's a kind of progression seeking where really you want to be truth seeking and you want to see, well, equally weight the positive and the negative data. We need to value the longer term more than the instant success and recognition. And we need to challenge assumptions where we see things that aren't right. You know, we need to say and call, call that out. Now, this is not unique to the pharmaceutical sector. This is just human nature. It's the same in our own research. And you can see that we could replace this pipeline for producing a medicine with pipeline to making a paper. You know, we want to get a paper, let's say in nature, and we see something that we think, oh, well, that's a really interesting result. And, and we, we, we get guided by the fact that we want to publish in nature and we want to publish something which is impactful. Um, and then maybe we start listening more to the sort of positive data, which is supporting our hypothesis than the negative data, which is really saying, well, maybe this isn't actually an effect. And of course, this then I think is really the problem that we have in reproducibility in, in research. And, you know, I think a lot of the work that's gone in the pharma industry is something that we can kind of port over more generally into the way we think about things in research. So I'd like to um, go back to a statement made by Richard Feynman, um, which is the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, but you are the easiest person to fool. And that is really the problem with, with us as humans. You know, we, we, we do always seek out information which, which supports our beliefs. And we do tend to be dismissive of things which kind of contradict that. And we have to be on our guard against that all the time. And all of the kind of things that Richard mentioned in his talk are the tools that we can equip ourselves to be on guard against those things and to make sure that we're in a truth-seeking mode. The other, um, the other, for example, is a very nice paper by um, Marcus, who um, yeah, runs this network, um, which brings out all the sort of good research practices that you should do in terms of development of a hypothesis and robust study, study design and ensuring things are statistically powered. And these are, again, all the sort of tools that we should be equipping ourselves with to do um, reproducible research. So I wanted to give some examples from uh, my own area of research. So I um, do um, metabolic imaging um, in um, looking at tissue and my own research is around trying to do that at the single cell scale. So if we have a piece of, um, whoops, if we have a piece of tissue like this and we've got all these cells, there's great heterogeneity amongst those cells. So even cells of the same type, you can see are subtly different. And we're all very interested these days in understanding that at a genomic level, the transcriptomic level, a proteomic level, and um, a metabolomic level. 
Um, and it's very difficult research. I mean, it's needed in the pharmaceutical industry because they want to know if a drug gets to a particular cell, does it get in that cell? And then does it have the right functional pharmacology? And are we changing the metabolic profile in that area? And it's very challenging because biology itself is um, not very, uh, it's highly variable. Um, so there are lots of challenges from that perspective. The way our methodology works um, is that we have some kind of probe um, and we have usually a tissue sample like this and our probe goes along. It could be various different types of probes. It could be ions or photons or it could be a chemical probe. But we dissolve material from that, which goes into a mass spectrometer and then we can register that with the probe position to get um, in the computer a hyperspectral image of the um, chemical uh, map from a um, tissue. But these are very complex pieces of equipment, as you can see, and each of these wires is some variable in that instrument that if it's not set correctly, could lead to erroneous results. So in my lab over many years, we've been trying to sort of unpick all of those kinds of issues and, and map those out so that users can set the instrument into the most reliable kind of space that it, it can be in to get um, repeatable and, and reproducible results between different laboratories. In our community, we have um, a number of ways of doing that. So as Richard was talking about, we have the um, CIPM, which is based in Paris, and that's where we can get nation to nation into comparability. So we can use reference materials, um, which go, go between those, those national metrology institutes, and that gives us our highest level of accuracy. But sometimes these, these are not directly relevant to the work that's done in the research environment. And then we need materials which are closer to it, for example, a biological material or, um, or some kind of organic, complex organic molecule. And then we tend to do these um, interlaboratory comparison studies, which we call pre-normative studies. So these um, don't themselves produce a standard. So they're, they're an, a, like a proficiency test will send out a sample with some kind of measurement protocol and guidance. And then people will measure that, return the data to us, and then we will show people where they fit within the spread of results. And this has been incredibly successful in our fields because it's allowed not only us to understand the science of what's going on, because instead of just one laboratory, one, one instrument in one laboratory, we now have 30 or 40 instruments around the world participating, all with slightly different combinations of configurations. And that is very rich data set to understand the sort of basic um, science of what's going on. But also by participating in these studies, it's allowed industry and academia to improve their protocols and to see how well they, they compare with other laboratories. And I'll show some examples of this. And over time, we've seen some you know, orders of magnitude improvement in people's ability to get repeatable results. We, if there's enough need from the user community, then we can take this um, information from these studies and these learnings and move that towards documentary standards. So these are what we call normative standards. Um, and these are consensus standards. They're agreed ways of doing things. It doesn't necessarily mean that it gives you an accurate result. Um, this work here, which gives you the traceability to international systems, will give you accurate results, but these will give you repeatable and um, precise results. So if you keep if you make that measurement on one instrument in Japan, let's say, that we should get the same result if we use a similar instrument in the US or the UK if we follow these standards. And they they depend very heavily on this pre-normative work. Um, which, as I say, unpicks that kind of multi-parameter space of all the different um, complicating effects. And this then, either directly through ISO or through VAMAS or um, through CIPM, supports measurements made in, in research and development. So this is um, a set of examples actually from some years ago in my earlier research career, um, looking at a particular technique called secondary ion mass spectrometry. Details of that aren't important. It's just a mass spectrometry of surfaces. And in the early days of this technique, the repeatability really was dreadful. So we, if, if, if we took data from our instrument and compared it 
uh, with another instrument in the UK, we were lucky to get results within about 80% repeatability, um, um, uh, reproducibility, I'm sorry, between the different instruments. And if we just kept on making the same measurement within our lab, then maybe we'd get 10% repeatability, something like that on a, on a good day. And we went through a whole series of intercomparison studies with VAMAS. So there was 17 labs in this first study, then uh, 32 labs in a follow-on study. And by the end of those two studies, we'd improve repeatability by around a factor of 10. So I think the average was around 10% to begin with, and then we got that down to about 1%. Um, so that was a really significant improvement. And then that went into an ISO standard um, for repeatability of the intensity scale. And, and this is now a standard that people can use um, to, to measure not only the repeatability of their instrument on the day, um, but also to look at the constancy of the relative intensity scale. So they can, they can track, you know, how much is their instrument varying over time? That can be logged with control charts. And for example, it may mean that you, if you see a variation, it's an indicator that's, that it needs a service because it may be a detector needs replacing or something is out of calibration. So in our own research, this is very valuable because you can see, you know, if you're trying to unpick effects in your results, you can keep an eye on the fact that your instrument is within the sort of control performance that you would expect. As a mass spectrometry, of course, we and very important to us is the accuracy of the mass scale um, and particularly in biology actually because we're, we have so many complicated peaks in there we're trying to identify what things are we really need to know with quite high accuracy um, what that value is and uh, we did um, an intercomparison study um, with 19 different labs back in the day and from that, we were able to, we unpicked the sort of the basic science because we'd had results from the previous intercomparison studies, which has shown us there was an effect going on. So that allowed us to do a lot of modeling on the instrumentation, understand the basic physics of why we got this kind of spread in the masses. And from that, we could come up with guidance, which we ran an intercomparison study. And that guidance allowed people to set their instrument, calibrate their instrument and get much better results. And then that, itself went into an ISO standard. So people then knew how they could calibrate it, but also they knew kind of roughly what kind of accuracy they might expect to get. Because people in their minds think, oh, we can get, typically people would think we could get five parts per million, but in reality, you probably couldn't get better than 30 parts per million. Um, that means you probably got at least 10 to 100 times more possible different molecules that could fit within that mass um, envelope. Than, than you perhaps thought. So it was a bit of an eye opener, I think, for people. Also very important to us, if you're trying to do any kind of quantification, of course, is linearity of the intensity scale. And again, we ran an intercomparison study to look at that and, and showed that using the appropriate methods, you could get the intensity scale um, calibrated because our, in, the instruments of those kinds have a uh, a dead time in the detection system. And uh, once that dead time's exceeded, then you start losing counts, but we can that can be well described. So these have been very beneficial in terms of improving measurements in that field. We also ran another intercomparison study in a different type of mass spectrometry called DESI. Um, again, looking at repeatability and reproducibility, which has been published. And I think that technique has now become very popular in sort of cancer and metabolite imaging. And I think you know, there will be a need for development of ISO standards for that in the near future. We also use this kind of methodology for doing 3D imaging. And this is um, data from many years ago of um, an organic multi-layer system. So a reference material that MPL develops, the, the red layers are about a nanometer thick. And the green kind of thing that you could see is a few hundred nanometers thick. Now you can see in this, these are results from an intercomparison study with 19 instruments, that the red starts fading away. If you look very careful, the spacing of those red lines, they should be at set spaces, but you can see there was a, they're, they're on a compressed scale. And that, again, allowed us to unpick very many interesting and important effects of the actual basic physics that was going on in those measurements. Um, and that was very critical for um, people to understand how to get better results. And as a result of that, and working with instrument manufacturers, 
we went from data like that to data like this. Now, this is actual real data. It's not a cartoon. So now you can see these um, monolayers, or these kind of nanometer thick layers, are now very sharp. And if, you, if we measured the spacing of those through the structure, they're very accurately positioned now, where before the spacing was starting to um, get compressed as you went down. Now they're accurate, and that's because we've been able to understand the basic physics of what was going on and make recommendations to, to analysts on how to do the measurements. And again, that went into an ISO standard that people can now use. It gives you, you know, the best practice and how to do this and use reference materials like a, I mean, MPL has a, an analog reference material that you can use. And we use that as standard for setting up our instrument training. When I have new PhD students uh, and new postdocs joining the group, that's the sample I give them. And then, you know, they can go through that standard and get the measurements um, and qualify their practice in, in that methodology. The um, National Academies of Science and Engineering um, did this uh, very comprehensive study on reproducibility and replicability in science. And, and they did actually highlight um, an article that myself and a colleague at Pacific Northwestern National Labs had um, done in, in, our, in one of our journals for, for, for um, for our community. Uh, and in that article, we've, we've basically been kind of going through all of these different things that, that we're doing as a community to try and improve reproducibility. So through raising awareness, like the various meetings that we have, we held a focus topic at this American Vacuum Society in 2019, which was really popular. Um, we've got lots of people talking about all the sort of the different instrumental effects that, that can cause a lack of repeatability. And as many techniques have be, gone from the expert user to the black box, which is kind of what you want from techniques, but the downside is that people have lost that knowledge about all of the different things that can be misleading. And there, we found that there is a real need for sort of tutorials and kind of that expert information for people to be able to pick on pick up on because if you do use instruments as a black box um, you, that can be very risky um, as we move into of course more multidisciplinary research um, the the it's more frequent that techniques are used as black boxes because you have such a sort of wide range of um, methodologies going into um, the research so these good practice guides protocols in my own group now I'm really trying to make sure that all of our papers coming out have much more extended step-by-step -step protocols. Um, so not only the sort of supplementary information, but then a supplementary protocol, which gives that sort of detailed step-by-step -step guide on how to do the experiment and also things to watch out for um, if things go wrong, um, to, to give the maximum kind of amount of help for people to be able to reproduce that results. Checklists, which you know, many journals are now starting to do, again to really encourage people to participate in the development of standards and these intercomparisons I, I think it's incredibly valuable and um, and actually you know can be very enjoyable as well because you you get part of a community and you can really see how well your instrument or your lab can perform um, without being exposed because everything's done um, you know, bl blind in terms of people can't identify who you are so it's a kind of very sort of safe environment to be in and you're also in touch with the ex measurement experts in that field. So there's, there's much, much to get from it. So just kind of coming on to my last slide, and I think um, personally that this whole issue of repeat, repeatability and reproducibility in research is, is part of a much broader topic of research integrity and culture um, and you know, repeatability, anti-bullying and harassment, ethics, bias, getting people into truth-seeking mode rather than the progression-seeking mode, which can be, you know, that means you have to have the right institutional leadership to do that, diversity and inclusion, and to challenge brand practice when you see it. It's not always easy to do that for people, but I think, you know, you need to do that when, when you see it. I, I feel very strongly that, you know, this all fits in in part of our research integrity and culture environment, and NPL is very committed to research integrity. Um, 
And yeah, with that, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for your attention and thank uh, my funders. So um, our government department, Bayes, Cancer Research UK and uh, the Wellcome Trust. And um, I finish a little bit early, but I think we can uh, have our five minute break and that'll give us a little bit more time for Q&A uh, later on. I see, see there's some questions in, but I, I guess we'll, we'll um, take them later. So. Let's have a five minute break and restart at 2.20. Hi everybody, I'm just going to invite Louise to share her screen now. Uh, Louise has just rejoined, so she may not have heard that last uh, request, oh, hi. Ian. Hi, hi Louise. Hi, yes, my PC decided to reboot. It oh, has yeah, impeccable <laughs> comic timing. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, what was your request, Ian? Oh, so you can share your slides. Share, share ah, your yes, screen, now right? that I'm back, I can get yeah. on with it, yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, no right, just in the process of sharing. So, uh, sure. I'm going to assume that you can now see my yep. slides. Yep, you're all Lovely. good. Okay, um, thanks, Louise. So we've heard about how metrology supports reproducibility. Um, we've heard some great examples from Ian about how um, matters have improved in his area in particular. And what I'm going to do is take a little bit of a look to the future and how we can use digital approaches to improve our reproducibility. Um, so... Uh, no, that one. Right. Um, what I'm going to cover then is metadata and why it matters. So Ian mentioned metadata a lot, but I'd like to dig down into what it actually is a little bit more. Um, then talk about data sharing and the FAIR principles a little bit. An example that we've of something we've developed at MPL regarding automation of capture and storage of both data and metadata and how we found that helpful. And then um, a quick discussion about traceability throughout a processing chain. So I want to start with an example. Um, if I'm designing a new product and I know that I want to make it out of steel and I need to get hold of tensile test data to make sure that I've got um, the performance that I need for this object that I'm designing, then there are lots of questions that I need to answer if I'm going to make sure that I've got the right data. So I need to know what grade of steel I'm interested in, what temperature the tests were carried out at. I might need details of grain size because that can affect material properties, the manufacturing method. I may need to know what atmospheric conditions the measurement took place under if I'm interested in, for instance, how it's going to perform whilst it's out at sea. I may be interested in strain rate for some applications. I may be interested in what length scale um, the tests undertook. And all of this is background information that tells me whether or not I've actually got hold of the right data. Because if I just type tensile test data for steel into the internet, then I'll get a million different answers. But these questions help me figure out whether I've found the answer that I actually need. And then even if I have found data that says it's the right data, how can I trust it? So we've talked about the uncertainties. We may want to know who made the measurement because that might affect how much I'm prepared to trust the data. I need to know calibration information. I need to know how the sample was prepared from a larger baton and things like that. So I think this example applies to an awful lot of, of um, data sets and needs for data that we have. We really need background information to make sure that we've got the right data. And we need background information about calibration and uncertainty, for instance, to ensure that we can really trust that data and to know that it's reliable. And that's what metadata is. It is data about the data. Um, it's the background information that gives context to the data. And to my mind, there are two important purposes that it has. One, and this is the one that really affects reproducibility, is that it enables somebody else to do exactly what you did to generate the data because the metadata will have all of the machine settings, all of the sample preparation steps, all of the conditions that were used when you generated the data. And the second one, which was more relevant to the example that I provided, is that it enables somebody else accessing the data to be confident that this is the data that they need. 
So if you're sharing your data, and particularly if you're making it freely available, the metadata is really what makes sure that people can use it in a meaningful and useful to them fashion. In terms of what metadata covers, um, it's incredibly broad, and this can be a bit of a stumbling block, really, because really it should include anything that might affect the data. Now, that's a very object, a very subjective statement, um, and there's a list of some of the more common points that are raised there. But really, the way that we can work out um, what is actually needed is through standardization and collaborative developments of standards. And this has already happened in some areas. So um, companies and bodies have worked together to generate metadata standards for particular types of data sets. So particular measurements, and in many cases done for a particular purpose. And these involve setting a standardized vocabulary and a standardized structure. And many of them have started from the Dublin core, which was developed by a group of librarians who were interested in metadata um, as a kind of structure or a starting point for people that acknowledge that metadata in their area is important and needs to be standardized. Now, Ian mentioned the FAIR principles, and he mentioned that these stand for findable, accessible, interoperable, which I have trouble saying, and reusable. And all of these are about the metadata and globally unique and persistent identifiers. So it's the persistent identifier that makes them findable in particular, but also the metadata, because the metadata enables you to search for exactly what you're looking for and for it to be found, because the metadata is associated with the data and that makes it findable. Um, interoperable is the one that's the most difficult to achieve, because this is really about ensuring that a data set that was gathered for one purpose can be used in a completely different application by somebody that may not think about um, all of the terms used to describe the data in the same way. So what we end up with is almost translation between different um, metadata descriptions that are used in different domains. And the principles as described are application agnostic and technology agnostic. So whilst the people that developed them in the first place came from a specific group of sectors, the principles that, the let, that they lay out can be applied to absolutely any data set. And it doesn't just have to be measurement data. It applies very much for sociological data, for um, poll data and things like that. And what's quite interesting about these is that they're not really focused on human findability. They're really looking to the future very strongly and are looking at enhancing the ability of machines to automatically find and use data. So already we use search engines, but if we're going to go beyond that and really share data in a meaningful way in the future, then the FAIR principles are what's going to guide us for that. And also, even though they're really about um, sharing data in many ways they're still really useful if you're not going to share the data beyond your organization because if you're capturing the metadata that you need to follow the fair principles then that means you're going to improve your um, likelihood of reproducible measurements internally because you'll know all the settings it improves your chances of being able to come back to a given data set in three years time and still understand um, how you gathered it and what it's for it improves um, the ability to fuse data across different um, groups within the same organization and so on now so metadata is clearly important and it's clearly great, but it's not actually that easy to capture in a lot of cases. Um, the simplest way to implement metadata capture is to provide an electronic form that people have to fill in and say to them, OK, um, I want you to write down in this. Um, I want you to fill in all of these boxes and I want you to cover everything that you might put in your lab book normally, but there's real difficulties associated with this. Um, the big one that we've found with electronic forms is that people will copy paste from previous versions and will only change the values that they think are important, even if they've changed other settings on the machine and things like that. Um, and this is for several reasons. One, the, the big one is probably that filling in metadata forms is not their main goal. Their main goal is to carry out the piece of research that they're working on. Um, and that kind of distracts them from the importance of the metadata because they're looking at what's immediately in front of them rather than what they're going to need in three years time and things like that and we found incidents of this um, across multiple sectors so the two graphs at the bottom are taken from some work that we did with the Royal College of General Practitioners 
Now, when you go and see your GP, they have an electronic form open on the computer in front of them. And whilst you're telling them about the symptoms, they'll be filling in some of that form. But as was the case in the example I described, they will only fill in the bits that they think are important. And the Royal College of General Practitioners gathers data from a large number of um, GP surgeries across the UK and aggregates all of that data. And in particular, the data associated with um, the first presentation of a person with a given set of symptoms to be able to identify when epidemics and in particular flu epidemics are starting. So if you're GP hasn't filled in the box that says, yes, this is the first time that this person has presented to me with this illness, you won't get picked up as part of that epidemic tracking. And it's not important to your doctor that it's the first time, they just want to make you well again. But it does mean that the data um, becomes very biased. So one of the things that we managed to do with the Royal College of General Practitioners um, is develop a very simple algorithm um, that enables does to correct for this this incident and you can see on the two graphs there that there is a, a very large gap of about 40 or so people between the maximum um, number of reports where we had corrected for the missing episode type which is is this the first time you've seen them and the ones that we managed to reconstruct and they've now implemented this algorithm in order to improve their returns um, within their system so we're pretty excited by that. Now you can also get metadata directly from your kit. So the image you can see on the right hand side there um, is taken from a laser flash thermal diffusivity measurement and has a human readable, um, essentially metadata structure just there. And this contains all of the information that the manufacturer thinks that you might need and is prepared to share with you. So typically you won't get any information about any correction algorithms, for instance, um, within this header. Some of it's automatically generated, but some of it is still user dependent. So you can see within that file, there's a couple of things that are labeled as unknown and that's or undefined. And that's because the user has chosen not to fill those in. So we're still dependent on user input. The other difficulty with this is that whilst um, it's in a standard format, it's almost certainly a standard format that only applies to that instrument. So if I have um, the same kind of instrument from another manufacturer, then I'm not going to be able to um, I'm not going to have the same format in front of me. And the difficulty with that is that um, whilst both formats will be human readable, it means that I have to be able to translate between them if I want to make all of this information machine readable. So that means that I have to essentially develop an algorithm or a program to read each different kind of file that I might potentially get, and that's inconvenient. Now, thinking a little bit about what machine readable versus human readable means and how we might need to adapt in order to achieve machine readability, I want to start by thinking about um, temperature, because this is commonly recorded across a huge number of measurements because it affects a huge number of measurements. So ideally, um, when I record temperature, I would like a number that has a unit associated with it. And this is Kelvin. Um, it's the SI unit, SI base unit for temperature. So that's the gold standard effectively for me. I'm prepared to accept rounding. I'm prepared to accept alternative units provided this they're um, clearly stated. So 293K is pretty good, 20 degrees C is pretty good. Now, a human can understand all of the versions that have just come up, um, 20 degrees Celsius, 293 Kelvin, things like that. And they can also make deductions about what the unit is likely to be given their knowledge of the system. Um, so if it says 20, then I'm going to deduce that it's that it's going to be um, Celsius rather than Kelvin and so on. And then you get some people who put things like room temperature in. Now, a human knows what a reasonable value is so that they can deduce the units, they can convert between units, they can read words as numbers. Whereas a machine doesn't know how to do any of those things, which means that if you're going to try and program a machine to manage this kind of system, you have to think of everything people might do and might fill in on that form if you want to have any form of data checking in there. And that's really difficult. So this is why we need to have standardized vocabulary, specified units within our um, capture forms, format checking and drop down menus so that people can't choose to write 
293 Kelvin um, in words or put room temperature in and things like that. So it's really about um, supporting people to make good choices about how they enter their metadata. So what we really need then is minimal metadata standards. I say minimal because people are more likely to fill them in if they're minimal with a standardized vocabulary so that everybody's agreeing across all of the things that they're talking about. And ideally, if we want to achieve interoperability, this will be a multidisciplinary vocabulary, but we're still a very long way from that. We want to take as much as possible automatically from the kit and make the rest of it easy to fill in and with no default options so that people can't just copy paste and things like that. Um, we need to have format checking and sanity checking built in there. So those processes that I described when I deduced the units and things like that can be used to sanity check the data when I receive it. And we need the metadata and the data to be very strongly linked um, so that when we come back to it in three years time and we're wondering what the settings were, they're easy to find because they're in the metadata. Now, some of my colleagues at MPL, um, Spencer Thomas and Frederick Brochu, have developed a framework to achieve this and have implemented it for one particular set of our measurements. So what you can see in the image there is um, the way that they capture information directly from the sample and from the sample storage system. Um, they capture the metadata from the kit that's gathering the raw data, and they use a really simple customizable web form to gather information from the experiment from the experimentalists. Um, the reason that we're using a customizable web form is we expect to be able to reuse this same framework for pretty much any kind of measurement that we want to make. And we take all of this and then we bundle it together within a curated database, the MPL object store, and we make sure that we store all of the metadata with the data together. And there are several reasons why this is useful, but one of the ones that we're seeing benefits from now is that we can create automated reports. And again, this really supports reproducibility. If when we publish a paper in the supplementary material, we provide an automated report in a standard format that says this experiment was conducted on that instrument under those conditions using these settings, then it means that people are going to be able to find our results and have confidence that um, these are the results that they need. And this approach could fold in other information as well. So you could pull calibration data in there directly. In fact, I think they already do that. If you're um, wanting to link to data from other tests on the same sample, you may want to pull training records in there so that under audit conditions, you're able to demonstrate that the measurements were carried out by a properly qualified person. You may want cost assessments in there and things like that. So there's lots of opportunities to pull in all of the information that you need um, directly. And we've published um, this approach, so it's available from the link just there. As I mentioned previously, um, it's based around automated capture from the kit where possible and a simple web form with a controlled dictionary for human input. And all of it feeds into a standardized XML schema so that it's machine readable. Um, and so far, we've stored around three terabytes of data with this and it's all searchable and it's all fair. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about data processing because most data these days are processed and merged with other data and things like that before they're actually used. And automated processing, um, again, can improve reproducibility because it reduces the subjective choices you might have to make, particularly um, if you're doing, if you're working with images, then frequently um, you're making choices about which area belongs to which material within your sample and things like that. If you have automated methods for those, then you're going to, um, increase the objectivity basically and that's a good thing but it does mean that you need to include the algorithm the software the version and so on as part of the metadata of the processed result um, in addition to that you need to make sure that you're able to link to all of the original data and metadata from the processed result because again you're trying to improve the reproducibility you're trying to clearly show the chain that got you to that final processed result that you're reporting and because all measurements require uncertainties in order to be meaningful, um, it's worth considering that any uncertainties associated with your input data are also going to lead to uncertainties associated with the process results. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, how we can handle that in a moment. 
but both of those effects need to be considered all the way through any processing chains. So in terms of uncertainty propagation, um, there's a lot of guidance that's already available. In particular, the guide to the expression of uncertainty in measurement, uh, which is called the GOM within metrology circles and its supplements, which are freely available. And there's a link just there. Um, that provides kind of the, the Bible as far as we're concerned when it comes to uncertainty evaluation. But there are some cases that I think I'm right in saying at present, it doesn't cover all that thoroughly. Um, we've had collaborative projects amongst some of the European national measurement institutes that have um, developed good practice guidance on inverse problems and on computationally expensive problems. And those are also linked to there. And this is an ongoing um, area of research for us and will continue to be so basically forever. Um, as new measurement techniques get developed, as new algorithms get developed, then we need as metrologists to understand how to propagate uncertainty through them. So at the moment, we're looking at things like machine learning, uh, quantitative image analysis, and so on. Uh, I want to touch briefly on digital calibration certificates. Um, these are a real opportunity. They're an opportunity to be able to share um, richer and more detailed information to end users who have their, um, who have their kit calibrated with us. So at the moment, typically we issue a paper certificate that has signatures and checking and a set of processed values out at the end of it and associated uncertainties on that paper certificate. If we had, um, if we had a machine readable certificate, then it would make it a lot easier to be able to um, share that information in future and in particular share it right the way through a supply chain. So we will be able to have a machine or an algorithm rather that will be able to follow the traceability chain right back to source um, to check that the claims made by um, a supplier, for instance, about the measurement of some parts that they carry out were traceable right back to national standards. So it makes it a lot easier to share the calibration information and because um, algorithms can process much larger volumes of data than people can it makes it possible to share more of the information so typically when we supply um, values and uncertainties we don't necessarily give a breakdown of all of the details that went into calculating those values and those uncertainties we give a summary but if we had digital calibration certificates, it would make it easier to be able to share all of that background information. Now, not everybody wants that, but it's still of potential future use. Um, so we're looking into it. Um, the current state is that we have an XML schema that's been developed by collaboration again of the Euro European NMIs, but we've also had collaborations with our colleagues in the US, China and Japan and so on, and they're looking upon this schema favourably, so it's likely to form the basis of a future standard. Um, we're testing it, as you'd hope, identifying gaps in it and trying to develop the tools that people are going to need to make this useful for them, really, and identifying what they're going to benefit from most so that we can focus on those areas. So in summary, then, um, metadata is what makes your data meaningful, not just to colleagues, collaborators and your future self, but ideally to machines as well, because machine readable data is going to become more and more important in the future. In order to make metadata really useful, we need to have standard vocabularies and structures. And in particular, this will enable better cross-disciplinary understanding, better sharing of data, better interoperability. We've developed a framework at MPL for automated metadata capture and storage. And that makes capturing, um, sorry, capturing what's needed easy and reliable. And when we think about what actually we do with our data, because we process it, we need to really consider um, the metadata and the uncertainty evaluation throughout that processing chain in order to have confidence in not just the data that we gathered, but the final result that we've um, taken out of that data. Thank you for your time. Great, thanks very much for that really nice talk, Louise. Um, so that brings us to the end of our uh, sort of three mini seminars and uh, I invite Richard and Louise um, now to participate in the discussion if you put your cameras on if you want to.
Um, and we've got a number of questions that have come up in the chat, so I'll, I'll try and go through those and then everyone else, please do feel um, free to um, chip in. So let me just find the first one. All right, okay. yeah, the first one um, was from Pranali, which is uh, Richard mentioned that the second isn't yet defined in terms of a constant of nature. So how does this affect the future proofing of the SI? Uh, that is a very good question. Well, the in fact, it, it doesn't particularly because the second is the unit which we can realize with the, the greatest accuracy anyway. So even as a material property based on how frequently an atom oscillates, we can realize that to about one part in 10 to the 18. So that's way, way more accurate by many orders of magnitude than other units. So actually, um, it doesn't matter that the second is still based on a material property for the time being. Is that, does that answer the question? Feel free to uh, unmute. I think Pranali, you also have another question, don't you? Um, how can a research check to see if an instrument or a technique they're using has a normative, pre-normative or more accurate standard already established for it? And are there any tools, resources or search techniques you could recommend? Also a very good question. And uh, so I, um, Richard will, can say something about the CMC database, um, which do you want to start with that, Richard? Is that the yeah. most accurate? That's right. I mean, where, where there are uh, calibration solutions and, and people who have uh, measurement capability already, um, then if you want to search that amongst national metrology institutes, there's a, there's a database where you can do that. I can, I can put that in the chat. Um, equally, when I showed that traceability pyramid, uh, that traceability flows down through, or, or from the NMIs through laboratories who we say are accredited. And they're normally accredited to do certain measurements by national accreditation bodies. And again, that's also databases that you can search in, in the UK, that, that's the United Kingdom Accreditation Service. Um, and then I suppose the final part of the question is, if you're interested in standard methods, then there are lots of organizations who would hold databases on standard methods that you could search. So the obvious one is ISO, the International Standards Organization. But I think Ian, as you mentioned, for some other areas, there might be more specific uh, documents such as the VAMAS database and so on. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the, the ISO website itself is actually pretty good and quite easy to search. So you could you know, usually find quite quickly, I think, if there's an ISO standard relevant to your topic area. Um, and then there are sort of domain sort of specific type activities, for example, like VAMAS materials related for these intercomparison studies. Um, and, and I think also, you know, you can get in touch with NPL and across NPL, of course, we have a massive network of measurement understanding and know-how, and we should be able to put you in touch with the relevant um, community um, where you can get access. Thank you. Um, yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the good question. Um, I'm just going to scroll down. Oh, here's another, yeah, another interesting one is, um, so, um, you know, we all, all of the publications showing the much of published research or a large amount of published research, sorry, is um, not reproducible. Um, how is it feasible to conduct research as a PhD student interpreting the results in terms of previous literature? Um, well, of course, it doesn't mean that all research out there is wrong. Um, and sometimes measurements are just very difficult to reproduce just because there is at the frontiers of measurement or the frontiers of science. Um, but I think the tools that we're talked about today are very good to help you in your, in, in your PhD. So this truth seeking mode rather than progression seeking mode, don't get caught up on a narrative, really look um, critically at, um, at, at different um, perspectives from articles from different groups, um, you know, look in, in that data and be critical of it because just because it's published doesn't mean it's right, as we know. 
Um, and I think, you know, try and build up your own sort of questioning and confidence about how good that data is and have they in their article been very clear about their method? Um, have, have they got an extensive supplementary information with the protocols that they've used? Um, I mean, they're all good indicators um, on the sort of the provenance of that research and, and the efforts that they might have gone to to um, check that it's reproducible. Um, I don't know if Richard and Louise want to add any any more to that. Well, I think it's very good uh, point, and Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because this is done uh, in a very critical and serious fashion when the metrology community looks at measurements of fundamental constants and when they decide on what the best measurements are and they do exactly what Ian says. So they look at all the measurements that have been made and they analyse those studies to see which ones they think ought to have the most weight because they have the most pathways to reproducibility mentioned, they have full uncertainty budgets and so on and so forth. And then they, they weight those uh, more highly. And so I think you could do a similar type of analysis yourself um, to see how, how much you believe these papers because of the extent of, of quality information they've got. Um, and I think it's also important to mention, of course, that uh, irreproducibility isn't necessarily a problem in, its, in itself. If, if you've made every effort to reproduce the work and you're still not getting the same results, well, actually, that's how a lot of scientific discoveries are made. So, um, you know, putting all the data up there is a necessary con condition of reproducibility, but it's not always sufficient because it may be that you've discovered something. I, I, I would keep that quote from Richard Feynman in your mind, that the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool and just <laughs> always keep that in the back of your mind because um, it, it's there as a sort of a warning, really, that we don't fall into a narrative of someone else's narrative. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. The next question is from Alex Mifam. And are there guidelines on what metadata is required or essential and what metadata is optional? Or should all metadata be considered required and essential? So uh, a question for you, Louise, I think. Yes, thank you, and a good one. Um, so the short answer is no, there are not guidelines. Um, the difficulty is that what people regard as important varies hugely from sector to sector. So what metadata people need in order to interpret a given measurement can vary sector to sector. Um, the difficulty of making all metadata required is that um, as discussed during the talk, it's really difficult to get people to supply things, which is why we end up with minimum metadata standards. Um, I think in general, what, I mean, what we have at the moment is that some sectors, some applications, some industries, and indeed some companies for that matter, have their own specific metadata standards for a given measurement for a given purpose. I think what would be useful would be um, to be able to link those together more strongly. And there is work, um, particularly amongst the European Open Science Cloud, that some of you may have come across, um, in being able to link those different um, link the standards from different areas together. Because I think a lot of the grand challenges that we're facing globally can only be um, addressed by having multidisciplinary research. And multidisciplinary research requires multidisciplinary data and hence multidisciplinary metadata. So it's a really big problem that these guidelines don't exist. Um, but what you can do is at least agree with the people around you that you're working with on a given project, that for this set of measurements, this is the information that we're going to capture. And that's really a start, because if you find yourself making those standards, they become de facto standards within your organization, and perhaps they can grow into something bigger and more useful following on from that. So I think start local, think global is probably the answer. Thanks a lot, Louise. And the next question is also a data one. And it's, are there any softwares which help in organizing raw data and analyze data? 
is it possible to make raw data of published papers online? And what would be the technical difficulties involved? What would be the financial cost of setting up such a system? Well, to, to kick off, there is the Concordat on open research data. So, you know, there is a big drive for the research communities from, from funders and, and researchers themselves to make uh, data more open. I think, Louise, you touched on this in your presentation towards the end on um, sort of frameworks for um, providing metadata for, for going along with data. I guess there is this kind of complication in terms of eventually, you know, what size for very large data sets, it can be problematic as how much you, you can store. But um, perhaps, Louise, you could uh, um, give some comments on that um, question. I think I think in some ways the solutions are less about software to help you organize things. Um, although there are things it is possible to use um, to some extent version control approaches to organizing your data. But often um, there's more questions around data repositories than there are software. So there are various um, public repositories, Zenodo is the most popular one that um, enable you to label your data and share your data potentially um, more broadly. And this applies for both raw data and analyzed data. Now, in terms of making raw data of published papers online, I'm not sure whether you mean um, uploading your raw data with the paper as supplementary material. Um, in which case, as Ian mentioned, this is something that's very strongly encouraged amongst um, a number of different journals, or whether you mean extracting raw data from papers that have been published, because that's um, not really not really possible by and large, I wouldn't have said. No, I, I meant like the raw files of, you know, from what uh, the analyzed graphs or uh, things are represented in the paper. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine a future where publishers require you to supply not only the um, the graphs that you've plotted from that and but also the data that went into that graph. But I think that's going to have to be a requirement from the um, from the publishers. And it's going to come down to, as Ian said, how you manage the storage, particularly when you've got um, graphs that are derived from processed results, where, as I discussed, you need to be able to get right back to the raw stuff that gave you those processed results in the first place. I think you end up with a storage space problem, essentially. Um, also, some people are very reluctant to share data because there can be intellectual property in there, particularly if you're working with people in industry. There's, um, you, there will be limits on what they're prepared to um, share and what they aren't. Uh, so, what are like if we? So, I had actually looked into this. Uh, what is the cost of storing, you know, large data sets? So, when there are companies or uh, other kinds of uh, institutions which need large data set storage online. Uh, what are sort of the costs of this? Like if you did say, let's say one paper is like maybe 10 GB of data, how much would that cost in terms of storing that much data, you know, forever to be accessible to everybody? I think of those data sizes, the, the free of, freely available systems are okay to use. I think it's when you get into the terabytes that you really start to kick into problems and uh, gets costly. But I think of the gigabytes, it's not too terrible, probably free. Is that right, Louise? Certainly, we, we put 10 gigabyte data sets out there and we didn't get any cost. I'm afraid I couldn't tell you offhand. Yeah, I think I think it's free at that kind of scale. But if you get up to terabytes, for example, if you cry OEM or something like that, then I'm, I'm really not sure. Then, then it would be your institutional data repositories. Or there is um, the re3.org, um, which is a... Um, a good website to go to because that has lists of community repositories and then oftentimes they could be free or funded via charities. I'll, I'll put the link for that on the on the chat. Okay, thank you. And someone's made a comment here about in their role as a reviewer, that they're kind of reinforcing this kind of message of asking the um, authors to have open data sharing. Of course, as a reviewer, that can really help you um, assess 
the work. I'm just putting the link to re3 or data or because that provides repositories sort of um, biomedical all sorts of different repositories that you can uh, um, use okay we have like one minute left i think now's the time for the burning question if you have any otherwise um, if there aren't then we can always be contacted um, i think we're easy to find on the npl system if you just uh, google our name to find us with our email addresses i would certainly be very uh, happy to help and also like i said earlier if you do have measurement problems or you do need um, advice then then get in touch with npl because you know we have measurement expertise in in all areas from quantum computing through to biological protein structure um, so there's someone who can help you or put you in contact with someone in the world who who can support you in in your research um, to get better measurement so i'd like to say a big thanks to Richard and Louise for their fantastic talks and um, a great a big thank you to everyone who's attended this session and for all the really good discussion and finally to the UKRN colleagues uh, for organizing the workshop so uh, thank you very much everybody thanks Ian. thank you